Thanks for joining us this week on Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. Join your hosts, Chris Marriott and Paul Schreiner each week as they talk email marketing, life, purpose, faith, but mainly email marketing. If you're looking for some normalcy in these crazy times, you've come to the right place. Welcome to, back to Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. Uh, my name is Paul Schreiner. With me, as always, is my colleague and friend, co-host, Chris Marriott. Delighted to be with you again, Paul, as always, and and very excited that this is uh, episode one of season two. Yeah. Uh, when we started this way back in in March, uh, we weren't sure there's going to be a season two, but here we are, kicking yeah. off season two. And why don't you talk a little bit about uh, who we've got uh, as a guest this week? Yeah, so we're going to do this a little bit different. Uh, basically, we have an incredible guest, Joe DeSanta of Spartan, uh, Spartan Races, um, Tough Mudder, really just a, a legend uh, among many, uh, us included. We had the opportunity to sit down with him and uh, hear, hear how uh, Spartan responded to the pandemic, what they did, how they did it, really absolutely fascinating. Oh, was a, a joy and a treasure to get to spend some time with him. Yep. Excited to share with our, our friends online. Now, if you want to hear our normal uh, banter, uh, which many of you, I'm sure, tuned in just for that. And to uh, see fan favorite producer David Inman. Yeah, uh, swing by uh, after the show. Um, that's going to be sort of in the post roll the in the there's a word for it i call it the outro I call that it works outro. yeah in the outro so anyway without further ado episode one hello and welcome to episode one of season two of email geeks having coffee at home having coffee i'm here as usual with my co-host paul schreiner hey 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 and we're thrilled to kick off season two with, with just an, an outstanding, outstanding guest. We think this show is going to be great. Today, we're, we're talking with Joe DeSena, who's the founder and CEO of Spartan Race. Spartan Race, if you haven't heard of them, is the largest, though I'd be stunned, is the largest and best obstacle race events company in the world. But that's not all. He's written three books around the Spartan lifestyle. He has his own podcast called Spartan Up. And more recently, he's been filming a series called Unbreakable CEO that's on their YouTube channel. And I'm only touching on some of the things he does. Um, spend any time looking into uh, what Joe does and you find there's content all over the place. So right. we thought the first question today for you, Joe, would be how on earth did you find the time to spend with Paul and I? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I somehow um, I fit it all in. You know, I start at 417 every morning and, um, and I go to about six at night and then by the time I, I pass out, probably at eight, but I, I just seem to fit it all in. You know what they say is you want to get something done, give it to a busy person, right? right. But, but the heart, our hardest challenge, our most difficult challenge as a business, you know, we operate in 45 countries. Yep. We have, um, we, we acquire Tough Mudder. So with Tough Mudder, without a virus, we're about 2 million people um, participating each year. Um, and, and, and the reason I bring that up because it sounds like a big number, but there's over 7 billion people on earth. And, and I, would say, I would say about a billion and a half of them need us more than we need them. Yeah. In other words, they're getting uh, a little overweight, they're unhealthy, they got diabetes, they, like all the things that the virus preys on, yeah. um, they need us. But yet, it's really hard for us uh, to convince them to do something difficult in their life. Yeah, and, right. So when you say, how do you have time to get like, I have to scream from the rooftops. I have to do podcasts like this to try to convince folks to do hard shit. And, and let, let me go one step further. People might not realize it, but the number one motivator for a human being, for our species, is the avoidance of discomfort. So, so think about that for a second. So the thing that has kept us on the planet for one million years is avoiding falling off a cliff, avoiding sleeping in the snow, avoiding getting eaten by a lion. We avoid discomfort. We don't even know. That's our legacy hardware and software that's protecting us. Right. We don't really need that anymore because we have Netflix, Wi-Fi, climate control. We don't need that software and hardware. 
So I'm in the business of trying to get, to get you to do something difficult and your hardware doesn't want to do it in age, right? right? So, so I make time for these interviews. Um, well, great. great. We, again, we do really appreciate it. It's thrilled to have you on this kickoff season two. Paul, you want to uh, yeah. take you the know, first I think, question? Sure. And I, honestly, uh, it really resonates. What you're saying now resonates. You know, we were reading uh, your books uh, in preparation for, for, for time here. And, you know, the thing that really stuck me over and over again was just um, we were wired for hard stuff. And when you were talking about sort of training regimen, of like uh, getting ready for one of the Spartan races or your death races or all of the races. <laughs> you know, you talk about like, man, we want to expect the unexpected. And the first thing that I thought about, and it was fantastic as I was sort of drawing lines between your uh, YouTube, the um, Unbreakable CEO, was like that mindset of um, expect the unexpected, be willing to go anywhere, do anything all the time, that showed up so strong in you, in your employees, when this pandemic thing hit, it was like, let's go, let's do this thing. I'd love to hear you talk because that's, I could see the passion bubbling in your eyes uh, when you were kind of. Yeah, the, the, you know, the um, true story, because I've studied uh, the ancient Sparta quite a bit with, with the professors that have dedicated their lives to it. And the, the uh, neighboring kings and queens and leaders of, of other um, communities around Sparta would joke to them, half joke to themselves and others, and they would say, those friggin' Spartans, yeah, they like going to war because war is easier than their daily training. Right. So, and so that's really what you're saying. You're saying the way we, the way we live, the way we recommend, we, you know, Spartan race, recommend that the employees in the community lives is like, so hard and so confusing for most of us pre-virus, but when the virus hit, it was like, oh, easy day, right. easy day. You know, I call. I don't it have to commute. Fantastic. I call it the baby virus, and it frustrates the fuck out of everybody. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not. I'm not uh, making light of of, of, oh. of the died, but but like, but like, I don't know. I mean, you you look at some of the imagery of World War II. And the shit people lived through, like, I mean, can you imagine pulling up on D-Day on, the, on, on, on Omaha, like one of those beaches? Yeah. Like, this is a baby virus compared to that shit. I mean, yep. so, and, and we, and most of us were like locked in our homes with Netflix and, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to piss a lot of people off with these comments, but, you know, and I get it. I know people died and I know shit happened and I know people lost their jobs and I'm not, I'm not making light of that, but, oh. but fuck, it could be a lot worse. Right. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were stuck at home, right? That's, it's, it's, we're going to survive this. Um, so I, I, I hear what you are saying. We're out of ice cream. There's no more ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> well, toilet you know, paper. when was toilet paper invented, by the way? We didn't have toilet paper for like 900,000 years. Right, right. Now, right. But we need it all right now. I need all of it. You know, it, it, you know one of the things that I think makes, uh, that was so interesting to us in, in, your, in your reaction, which we saw, you know, from, from our perspective, again, we're email marketing geeks. And um, so I, we saw what you did before we saw the Unbreakable CEO uh, episode yeah. two, where you talked about it. And in incredible. fact, we talked about you guys in our very first podcast we ever did, which was only eight, nine, eight, ten eight weeks episodes. ago. Yeah, um, yeah. And and but we we brought Spartan Race up because we were you know we were talking about how amazing it was. Here's a company that is a a really a mix. A, a lot of ways, I mean, it, you know, very unusual. Disney's one of the few others I can think about it where your mixture of events, activities, commerce, yeah. and content. Yeah, but before the pandemic hit, the, the the strongest leg in that pillar was your events, obviously, and we saw an amazing pivot. You know, you yeah. talked about it as a company wide thing, but we saw an amazing pivot just in your email marketing, where it went from sign up for this race, sign yeah. up for this yeah. race, almost overnight. 
to the Unbreakable Daily. Overnight, you had it launched from scratch. You'd launched a new email campaign that kept your people engaged instead of just saying, you know, being deers in the headlight, you, you know, right. you pivoted. And then, you t and then we heard you talk about it and we understood where that fire came from. But, you know, we thought whoever headed up your email marketing deserved a medal. That, that was unbelievable. I need so, you, I, I need you know, guys. Where's the question in this? Well, talk a little bit about how you did that pivot because for people who haven't seen episode two, you know, how did you rally people, everyone from your email marketing team all the way up to instantly pivot to a media and, and marketing company? I got to tell you a couple of things. One is you got to send me an email um, and just say in a few sentences what you just said, because I want to share that with the marketing team because they did the work. And I, and, and, um, and number one, number two, I, I very much uh, think like you, we are like a baby, baby Disney um, in the sense that they have theme parks, right? They have content, they, yeah. they, but they have Buzz Lightyear. We don't have Buzz Lightyear, but I'm working on it. That yet. You don't have, but you don't have a mascot. You know, maybe Paul could be your mascot. I, he, I don't he, think he that's such a good mascot. idea. <laughs> uh, but, but I'd love for you to send me an email. And, and by the way, we have a long way to go to, to be better at email marketing. Um, but the way it happened, really, I can't take much credit for it. I mean, I was stuck in an airport for 17 hours, well, stuck traveling for 17 hours to make the window um, back into the United States after Trump shut the, the world, the, the country down. And in those 17 hours, I just had a moment of clarity. I, I had the opportunity. You know, everybody uh, has a, should have their own set of personal, like their own personal board of directors. Mm -hmm. And I'm fortunate in that the Spartan brand allows me to talk to um, the Pentagon, uh, right. the owner of Saks Fifth Avenue, uh, the largest hedge fund in the world. Somehow I have access to, to these people. Um, via text, like in two seconds, yeah. anybody really. And, and, you know, in those 17 hours, the, the message I distilled after talking to some people was, we got to protect any liquidity we have in the bank because money's going to dry up really fast. Yeah. Um, we've got to protect our employees, even though we're going to have to furlough 75% of them doing quick math in my head, traveling from Athens yeah. to Heathrow. And then, fuck, we've got to talk to our community. Like we've never talked to them before. Yep. So don't, one, many of them need us, right? We are, we yep. are the rock in their life. Um, but we need them just as much because when the lights come back on, we need them to come back to the theme parks. Right. So um, that was right. my only message. I mean, by the time I landed in the United States, the team figured it out. I don't know what they did. I, I'm not that smart. I just, that was my message. Right. And, and the team did everything. And I'm not bullshitting, the team did everything. I, all, all they asked of me was to wake up at four and do four live workouts a day. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's You're me. Basically, you just said, Joe, is I'm me. <laughs> do workouts, okay, <laughs> done. That's so, good. so do you, so, and Paul, I, mean, I, I don't want to dominate, I'll let you come back in here, but I want to, I want to follow up on that. Um, and maybe you haven't thought this far ahead, but, but you developed, you have developed a, an enormous amount of, of sort of content franchises, whether it's Unbreakable CEO or the Unbreakable Daily. Uh, you know, are, are these things that you think now you will continue with uh, going forward, even after you're able to start your events again? And I know that you have a first event uh, scheduled for June 13th in Jacksonville. Uh, is is are you going to keep going with the content as well now that you've created these franchises or do you see yourself going back to sort of a event focus you know i just love that you came up with the sentence of um we're very much like like disney because i i recently had to share my vision with the company to make sure we're all you always have to make sure you're completely aligned right you got to yep. be aligned with your family got to be aligned with yourself your own goals and and certainly your company and, and one of my messages was, I can see it really clearly, guys. We're in the event space first and foremost because that's, that's who we are, that's what we do. We help hold people accountable. That's like, we're not gonna stop putting on events. And we've got different event brand names, just like yep. Disney, Disney has different rides. They've got Space Mountain, they've got, mm -hmm. they've yep. got whatever. whatever. Um, secondly, we've got a thriving merchandise business thanks to COVID. Um, we, we were trying to build the merchandise business to be, you know, bigger and bigger. And, and um, 
as you can imagine, uh, as soon as everybody got locked in their houses with their credit cards, um, <laughs> online, sales, online sales went up. Right. Right. So um, it's forced us to work out a lot of the friction and logistics and, and merchandise. And so to me, that's, that's an obvious business. We're not going to be Lululemon anytime soon, but we've got a particular slant on merchandise and I want to keep pushing that. Number three is, is sponsorships and partnerships. Um, there's lots of companies from a Mercedes Benz um, all the way, you know, all the way down to, uh, well, not all the way down to, but even a Harley Davidson. Big right. companies want to partner with us because we stand for goodness. We, yeah. we, we rip people off the couch, we get them healthy, right? So, so those are, those are the three and, and please push back if you think I'm not thinking about our business correctly. And then, and then there's two supporting actors and actresses in this, in this movie for me. Okay. One is technology and one is content. Yeah. And I, I don't see us. I mean, we did have a primetime television show on NBC until uh, the rock Dwayne Johnson stole it from us. But, but, um, and, and we've got lots of content like that you pointed out. But I don't see us making enough revenue from that content anytime soon. Right. Um, however, we need it, just like most companies need it, because we've got to engage consumers. We've got to tell authentic stories, and we've got good stories to tell. We're a storytelling machine when it comes yeah. to human transformation, sport, et cetera. I wrote stories to tell and circled it because I wanted to talk with you about that. Yeah, <laughs> and then technology, we've been in a technology deficit for – you guys don't know it, but I've been, I've been banging my head against the wall trying to make this thing work for 20 years. So, and we've always been in a technology de deficit because of me, because I was always, first of all, I'm, I don't lean that way. You guys lean that way, right? With your mm. email. email. Absolutely. We're email geeks. Yeah, I don't lean that way. If, 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 if there was a computer outside of the house on one table and all you had to do was go over to the computer and figure out how to send an email, and on the other table was a hammer, and a stone and some cement, I would go to the hammer, stone, and cement. I would think like, you gotta build a house with that, or you gotta send an email. I'm going to the table with the hammer, stone, and cement. <laughs> so so um, uh, I just don't lean that way. And, and, um, but we gotta get rid of the friction. It, you know, Amazon's figured out how to push one button and you buy something. Like, yep. there's a lot of work to do on the technology side. And so I don't know, that doesn't answer the question as well. Um, maybe as you hoped, but, but that's the way we think about the business. No, that's good. So, well, all right. And Paul, I know I promised you let you, you go to town. This is all no, good. I just, does, does, say it ain't so, Joe, does that mean that I've seen my last episode of Unbreakable CEO? Is it, is it done with episode three or do you have another, at least one more in the can? I, they got me, felt, you know, because I wake up at 417 and start doing work, I'm not kidding. They've been telling me the last two days, you got to get up at 3 a.m. so we could film for the unbreakable CEO segments. So, no, you're going to see more. I'm going to look really tired, but you're going to see more. <laughs> That's okay, good. good. Um, well, that was kind of where I was going to. Um, all right, Paul. Now I'll let you. No, yeah. it's all good. Uh, you know, we work with email marketers, and our, our story was um, when this whole pandemic thing hit, we saw the same thing. We've got a bunch of people, uh, young, you know, 20, 25, 30, right in that age group, who are doing the brunt of the email marketing work and driving the economy forward. And if those people get discouraged, man, we're screwed. And so Chris and I kind of talked about it, like, what can we do to dial up content to get those folks excited, enthused, energized? Because again, when the, you know, the, the pandemic is one thing, right? Okay. We've got this flu, and I wouldn't trivialize it either. It's kind of a sucky, sucky flu. You know, I think that's what it is. And if you're susceptible, it's going to suck worse. Got it, okay? We also have this other side that's the economy just, you know, blowing up. So how do, how do we get through that? And, and I see it through digital media. And, you know, when you said, you know, we amped up content marketing by 10x, we're, we're a digital publishing company, people. You know what I mean? Like that's, to me, it seems like that's the kind of thing that becomes another leg to your stool going forward. I mean, kind of what you were saying around merch and all that. Uh, what's the role of digital for you guys going forward? Is it be, gonna become more of, uh, of, the, of the plan or is it gonna be 
Uh, well, I mean, I mean, we don't sell our merchandise in flea markets. I'm being facetious, right? right. We, we don't sell tickets at um, an old fashioned uh, ticket counter where people like right. we, digital is everything we do. That's how we connect with our consumers. That's how they buy from us. And so making slight changes and slight, slight te tweaks and being having a better message um, that could result in an extra five million dollars in revenue. So right. like every, everything is digital. Um, the issue has been and will be for the foreseeable future is that because I didn't lean that way, we're in a deficit with all this stuff. Right. We're getting better. You guys notice we're getting better and, and, and the virus forced us to, um, to just be better. Well, and that's the thing about this thing is it's caused a bunch of people to innovate and be better, right? Um, are you seeing that at the individual level in, in the stories? I mean, you guys get you guys get to hear stories about life transformation, right? Uh, like as you, uh, marriages uh, staying together, families staying together, people staying in jobs, people becoming better. Are you hearing the stories get better as well? Yeah, I mean, the stories have, haven't changed in 20 years. The stories that we have gotten and continue to get are, I'm back with my husband, I'm back with my wife. I quit my job and started a business because of Spartan. You know, you gave me the confidence. I lost 200 pounds. I decided that I was so tough after doing Spartan races that I got in a rowboat and rode across the Atlantic. I mean, you, <laughs> the list is unfucking believable And they're in, the, in their hundreds of thousands. And so I say to myself, Oh my God, if we could somehow bottle that, right? tell those stories, yep. yeah, they're, they're unbelievable. But we, we're, we're, we're like a change agent. We're like a spark that right. everybody's resilient. Everybody's gritty. Like we will not on the planet as long as we did as a species. But um, sometimes you need a little kick in the ass, and that's what we do. We give them a kick right. in the ass. Well, I like in uh, one of your, one of the episodes of the, um, Unbreakable CEO, you said, we did good work and God noticed. Mm -hmm. I thought, man, what a great quote. <laughs> did you, did, were you like, let me write down what's a good quote? <laughs> no, Got it. I do say often, you know, a lot of people ask me, and I'm not supposed to say this. My mother used to say, my mother was like bohemian. She was pretty forward thinking back in the 70s. And she said, um, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what church uh, you go to, you, you just got to be a good person and, and, and be careful the words you choose because when you, they become reality. And I couldn't reconcile that as a young kid. Like that doesn't make sense to me. Words become reality. So I'm careful in saying what I'm about to say to you, which is in many companies, we talk about what's your exit strategy. Yeah. Yep. You guys heard that before. What's your exit strategy? And for me, it became clear that my exit strategy is death. And what I mean by that is I'm taking this thing till the end. Like I'm yep. not, like that's my exit strategy, but I got to be careful. I don't want to die, right? so I got I got to be careful with my work. <laughs> but but um, but I so I say that a lot. And the other thing I say a lot when I'm having a tough day, which is every every single day, right? Running a business yeah. is difficult. I say, well, we've got this big audacious goal. We want to change 100 million lives. It gets me a free pass into heaven. So, yeah. and you know, it's I'm half joking, right? But but like, you know. Let me, let me go a little further on this one. When times get tough and your back's against the wall, you can't make payroll, uh, you lost one of your great employees, your customers went to a competitor, um, or, or you're running a marathon and you're at mile 18 and you can't take another step. If you've got a, a big vision and a big goal that you've set your, it helps you through those tough moments. Right. And, and so for us, the thing that helps me through those tough moments is we're changing lives. Yeah. Like, like if I was selling handbags or cotton candy, when, <laughs> when times got tough, I'd be like, get me the fuck out of here. Just sell right. it. I can't take it anymore. I'm now a cotton candy eater. That's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta have, you gotta have a big vision, a big goal, and it's gotta be something so good that you're so proud of that it pulls you through the tough times. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. If you were to give email marketers, again, sort of framing it around that, the, the concept of, you know, these are people who can drive the economy forward. What advice, I want you to put your motivator hat on for a second. Uh, what advice would you give them? So email marketers, those that are pushing the keys and the buttons at companies 
globally. Right. So the, the brick and mortar shops are shut down. There is no revenue stream other than through digital. We are pushing content into people's mailboxes that says, get a pair of shoes, get a whatever, right? Uh, keeping and, and their direct work keeps people employed, right? I always believe, you know, my first customer was the boss of an organized crime family. I was, <laughs> I was, I, read, I love that story. <laughs> I was like preteens. And he said to me, this was like my first business. This was the first thing I was going to do. And he was a cleaner, pool cleaner. He was going to teach me a lesson. So I go over his house Saturday. I'm there at 8 a.m. He told me to be there at 8 a.m. He's going to pay me $35, which was a lot. Yep. Um, and, and he said to me, I'm going to teach you three lessons, three business lessons. He said, number one, if you're going to be here at eight o'clock, you better be here at 745 because on time is late. Yep. Love it. Stuck with me the rest of my life. Um, I'm always, there's always friction between me and my wife because I know if I got to do something at 630 in the morning, I'm going to work on it the night before. I don't want to be like right. 629 in mass mayhem, right? So right. on time is late. Uh, number two, if you're going to clean the swimming pool, you have to clean the shed and the lawn furniture and the wind, all the things I'm not paying you, you got to go above and beyond. Because when I get home and I see you were here and everything looks great, I can't live without you. Like your service is so unbelievable. Not only am I going to keep using you, I'm going to recommend you to 40 of my friends. And then uh, number three, never ask for money. Never have your hand out for money. If you provide value, you get paid. And he said that like that one I was afraid of a little bit, the way he said it, right? Right. <laughs> so, um, so I would say to the email marketers around the world, take that, take that one lesson he said where you got to go above and beyond. I would add value to people's inbox. If you just send me an image of a pair of shoes you're selling, I don't know if you're really adding value to me. Mm -hmm. like, tell, you know, tell me why I should walk barefoot uh, for 20 minutes a day. Give me, give me content. Right. Give me something that's valuable to me and build a relationship with me. And then I'm probably going to buy something from you. Love it. Love it. You know, and what, one of the things, uh, things I find, I found really interesting was, uh, and I can't remember which, where I found this in, in uh, whether it was in the book or, or uh, somewhere else, but, but you were talking about early in the company where you, you made your investors head explode because it was certain product that you didn't believe in. So you weren't going to let them be a sponsor. And I won't name the product. I'll let you if you want to, but, 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 you know, you, you just said the brand can't, you know, in essence, the brand can't afford that type of partnership. And, and I mean, I thought that was such a, because, you know, that you rarely see that in a company, you particularly rarely see that in a company, you know, that's still struggling. Cause I know this was early. Um, you know, do you re regret that decision? Uh, have there been other times where you've made sort of that same tough decision to do the right thing over the, ex you know, the easy thing? It's very, very tough. I mean, I, I remember that moment uh, very clearly. Um, it was a million dollar check that we desperately needed. But, um, but you know, it's really long term versus short term thinking. Right. And, and it comes back to uh, my favorite test um, in the world, 1972, Stanford University, Professor, professor Walter Mischel uh, takes a bunch of children, puts them in cubicles and puts a marshmallow on their desk. And he says, kids, you could eat that marshmallow now, or if you wait, I'll come back and give you a second one, right? If that's the, it's the marshmallow test. Are you yeah. going to take the cookie or the marshmallow now, or will you wait to get more later? And I am the ultimate. I would have out, I could have outweighed Professor Mitchell <laughs> by 30 years. I would have had, the whole room would have been filled with marshmallows. Just, that's just the way I'm wired. And um, I'll tell you a quick, funny story. And then we go back to, to your question. When I learned of this study, my son Jack was like, I don't know, five years old, six years old. And I said, um, I said, I gotta test them. Right. I gotta see what we got here. Right. And we, it was out late one night and I offered Jack a scoop of ice cream. It was already past his bedtime. So I was making excuses in my own mind that if my son failed, it was okay because there was a bunch of contributing factors. And I started my clock. He didn't notice on my phone. And I said, you know, you could have the scoop of ice cream now, or if you wait, I'll get you two. And three and a half minutes in, he turns to me. It's like five, maybe six years old, probably five years old. And he turns to me and he says, dad, how long do I have to wait to get 15 scoops? 
And the greatest- I want the whole company, Dad. <laughs> it's the greatest answer ever, right? Because, because when you ask about the sponsorship deal that I didn't do, I'm playing and you guys should be playing and we should all be playing for 15 scoops. We right. should be playing for one scoop. And so um, now, you know, you know what a lot of people say to me when I tell them that, well, well, you don't know if the 15 scoops are coming. I go, that's the fucking point, asshole. You don't know if they're coming. You deal, right. you deal with the pain. You know yeah. you got the scoop in front of you. That's an easy decision. I had right. the million dollars in front of me. I had that sponsor. I don't know if I'm gonna get better sponsors later. That's the deal. That's the right. deal. But I'm playing, I'm playing a long-term game for 15 scoops and I can't tarnish. By the way, can you imagine how Leonidas would feel with his 298 men buried from Thermopylae uh, 2,500 years ago, if I tarnish the brand with a bad sponsor? That's a very good point. <laughs> That's a very good point. There's some uh, consequences there. Um, when we were uh, watching, uh, you, got, you interviewed Kyle Dake, a uh, wrestler for Cornell. And I've got three, three high school boys uh, who all wrestle. And you went from here to there. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, yeah, they're pretty excited where, about where, where are you? Um, how old are the boys? Uh, Single Mountain, Tennessee. Uh, my oldest just turned 18 yesterday. I have a 16 year old and then a 14 uh, year old. And so then I have two girls as well. Talk, can we talk wrestling for a minute? Oh, we can talk wrestling all day oh, long. Oh no, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> all right, so check this story out, guys. So I was not a wrestler. I didn't know anything about wrestling. And we had our first son, Jack, who I just described with the ice cream test. And yep. um, I saw the movie Kill Bill with <laughs> Uma Thurman. Mm -hmm. You guys don't know this story. So, and yep. she's carrying buckets of water in yep. front of her master. I don't know the, the actor's name in that movie. And I said to myself, man, wouldn't it be awesome to have a kung fu master live with us and train the kids? Right. I ran it by my wife. She says, okay. I call uh, a friend of a friend of a friend and I get a Kung Fu master from China, no English, to move in on our farm, okay? I'm not kidding. So, so the deal is, with the, I gotta get somebody to translate, he doesn't speak English, and um, the deal is, check out this barn. Can you guys see the barn? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so in this barn, which is separated from the house by 20 feet, and that's a significant little tidbit of information, the, the, the Kung Fu master is gonna train, this is like a dojo, the yep. Kung Fu master is going to train the children. At that point, at that point, the two boys were old enough to do it. My daughter wasn't quite old. She might have been two or something. Anyway, every day. Yeah, a little young. A little young. Every day in the barn, they're going to be trained at 5.30 a.m. and then again 5.30 p.m. because I'm paying him. He's living sure. here. And if I'm going to pay him, I want to get the most out of it. So we're going to do two a day, seven days a week. If we go on vacation, Kung Fu master comes with us. Seven days a week, two a days. Uncle Kung Fu. <laughs> Kung Fu, right? No English. And, right. and he's not smiling at them. Like there's a lot of screaming going on in this barn. And if, my, if my wife heard it, which is, which is why it's significant that it was, ah. if my wife heard the screaming, it would have been shut down. Like mothers are just generally protective of the, the, the cubs and the children. Yes. So she never heard what was really going on in here. <laughs> it, was, it was craziness. So, um, so anyway, fast forward like three or four years, this is going on, for me, okay? Two a days. And um, three or four years. <laughs> I'm in New York City, and I'm with some old Wall Street friends, and I'm sitting at this dinner with like six or seven guys, and I'm pounding my chest that I'm the coolest dad ever. I got this Kung Fu master, I'm bragging a bit, right? And um, my friend says, oh, I grew up next to a guy who was an ex-Green Beret, and he had two children my age in Seattle. And the two boys, uh, he wanted them to be wrestlers. So every night, he'd take the two boys down the basement, turn off the lights, and they had to wrestle blindfolded in the dark. Do you know this story? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I'm a, I, I wrestled, I'm coaching now, you know, it's, but please, I love this story. Chris, I don't know this story. I don't know it. It's please, never been it's wrestling. spectacular. Well, and I'm from Seattle originally too, so that's. Okay. So every night down the basement, blindfolded in the dark, training to the point where like it was, uncomfortable for the wife, the neighbors want to call social services. Anyway, fast forward, one of, one of the, they both go to like a really high level of, of wrestling, but they don't earn Olympic, they don't get medals. 
So one of them becomes the assistant coach at Stanford University. While at Stanford, he brings neighborhood kids into the mat, on the mat to mix it up for his students. One of the neighborhood kids says one night, hey coach, I got nowhere to sleep. Could I sleep on the mat? I got locked out of my apartment. Coach says, don't be ridiculous, stay on my couch. That night, 2 a.m., door creaks open to his bedroom and um, random act of violence, the, the, the guy's gonna kill the coach. And he strips the coach down to his underwear, zip ties his hands behind his back, zip ties his legs to the chair, pillowcase over his head, presses the revolver. Story's a little more detailed than I'm saying because I'm going through it quick. No, you're good. And, and the coach, his name is Jay, he's a good buddy of mine. The coach says, uh, do me a favor, can you shut the lights before you pull the trigger? As a, as a courtesy. <laughs> Perpetrator, perpetrator shuts the lights. And now, now the coach is in his element because he trained in the basement under his right. dad, ex Green Beret in the dark blindfold over 10 years. He, he, he um, disarms him, pins him on the ground while tied to the chair in his underwear with a pillowcase over his head, calls, nine, calls 911 from behind his back. Stanford police break the door down, come in and, and find a scene that looks like a scene from Pulp Fiction. Right. I hear this whole story Three and a half years into my Kung Fu master program. And I'm like, I got to meet this fucking guy. <laughs> well, of course you do. Where is he? He goes, he, he, he's in California. I said, uh, Courtney, we're going to California. My wife, jump on a plane, fly to California, meet him like the next day. And I said, we got to get rid of the Kung Fu master. We got to get wrestling. I, I got to get, get rid of the Kung Fu master. I don't want Kung Fu anymore. I want wrestling. So we got rid of the Kung Fu master. And I brought in an Olympic wrestler. And, um, and so the kids have been wrestling now. <laughs> well, that's great. And it's, I think it's such a fantastic sport, teaching discipline, all the things that you are, your brand is, and that's wrestling. That's it. So wait, I'm going to go one, I want to go, I just love wrestling as much as you do. All right. So a, a woman named Andy Rovat has been on lockdown with us, uh, 2008 Olympian in wrestling. He just I, I actually saw that in one of your videos, and I was like, "No!" Yeah. You, you, you also had him doing the kids. You had him doing the kids. Sorry to interrupt, but you had him doing the Facebook kids training videos too. Been doing so the kids training for eighty days in a row. Getting a lot of value out of that, uh, out of his being stuck there. <laughs> he wasn't planned on, on being. He came for a meeting with me, and, and and the whole lockdown happened, and he just stayed. And so, Andy's been here, and um. Andy lived in Russia for over a year to study why they earn more gold medals than yeah. any other country in wrestling. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, let me show you guys. The beginning, we have a mountain here in the backyard on the farm. Can you guys see that mountain? I yep. sure can, yeah. yeah. So it's about a thousand foot climb. Um, it's uh, one mile to get bottom to top. And uh, we, we do a round trip and let's call it 45 minutes to an hour if the kids are being difficult takes a little longer. And um, I was with Andy and, and he said, you know, the Russians, they don't lift weights like we do in the US, all these barbells right. and weights and everything. He goes, they do two things for wrestling. What do they do? He goes, they hike and they climb ropes. Yep. So today was day 80. We have been hiking and climbing ropes for 80 days straight. Wow. And, um, I bet your kids love you. <laughs> it, went, it went from, can you get up the rope once to you got 30 rope climbs today. Uh, now, are wow. they using their legs or are they just using grip? So Jack now, when we started, could not do it without legs. Today he did five, he stayed on the rope for five climbs without legs. Good for him. Didn't touch the bottom, yeah. So wow. that, just takes, that just takes lots of repetition and lots of pain. Yep. So. Uh, well, our lockdown, I don't know if you can see this or not. Um, yeah, we can uh, well, as soon, well, maybe I'll, let me see if I get it back. Come on. As How soon far, as I'm, the, uh, I'm as driving, soon, wait, wait, I'm driving down to uh, Florida. How far are you off the beaten path on my trip to Jacksonville? Uh, let's see. Um, I would guess six hours oh. off the interstate. If you're, yeah, yeah. If, yeah, if yeah. you're close, I'd, I'd stop and wrestle. You know, we'd, we'd bring the kids to wrestle. Oh, oh yeah. No, I'd, so love like, I'd, I'd pay to see that. Come on. <laughs> When, uh, when the uh, pandemic hit, um, I hopped online and I was like, I need to find a wrestling mat for our living room because otherwise our place is going to blow up. And so, you know, I hopped in the van and drove up to Cleveland, Tennessee, found one. 
And, you know, before everything locked down tight, we were in by like an hour, right? trying to honor the, 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 the lockdown as best as we could. Nice. So okay. anyway, we've been here. You'll, you'll appreciate it. Sorry. I saw you you're missing the middle of the mat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they just weren't put together correctly. We got them. Oh, do you? Okay. That's here. We're leaving today for Jacksonville, but this has been, um, Oh, nice. You see the rope? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. We got the rope. We got the mats. My friend sent me this awesome treadmill over here. That's fantastic. And we, um, you know, we look, look, we're, let me show you. We're going to Florida, right? The whole family. Right. Let me show you what, what is imperative that we have. You can see medicine balls. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, all, it's all equipment. Right. That's what we need. We need the wrestling mat. I don't need, we don't need clothes. My wife and I fight. Well, we, need, we don't need anything. We just That's need wrestling mat. Equipment. Did, 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 look, before you got rid of the Sensei, though, did, did, your, did your boys at least learn the crane kick? They had a whole series of movements that they got really, really good at. And shame on me, they lost that when I lost the guy. You know, when I, when I um, booted him, they lost that because uh, that, was a, that was a special art that only he was teaching. I, I, shame on me. I should have learned it myself. Yeah. I kept it going, but... Um, I pivoted. I immediately pivoted to wrestling. Right. Well, you know, I, and not to take anything away from that, you know, in, in, in the martial arts, you learn balance, right? Centering your body, all of that, that's going to transfer everywhere. So you may, you may lose the sequence, but they, they learn the key parts. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, um, I go on that forever. Uh, <laughs> I know, me too. Chris, are there other things you wanted to cover? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to keep, I mean, you've been very gracious with your time and I see you're loaded up, but, but I did want to say, um, uh, you know, getting back to your first, you know, you, you, you had your first race, which, which to me is a great sign that things are returning to normal um, or, you know, at, at least slowly returning to normal. How, how tough a call was it to make, to have, to, to have a race? I know Florida has been open for quite some time and, and has had time. zero real issues from that early opening, despite a lot of predictions of doom and gloom. It's actually been pretty good, fine, in fact. What was that a tough call to make, or was it was you know based on on whatever everything we saw, you know it was like all right, let's go, strap it on. One of the things we didn't talk about was I started a 5:30 a.m. warrior call at the very beginning of the pandemic, and and the reason was a few um, folks that give me advice, my personal board of directors. I think the reason they call me or hang out with me is because I'm up or I'm I'm up super early. You can call yes, me. Yes, you are. <laughs> I'm answer the phone. And so I said, you know what? I need some smart people. Uh, we'll get on a Zoom call. And then it grew. It grew to about, at its peak, about 150 people. And it was scientists, doctors, military, um, folks from Japan, all the way down to Brazil, all around the world. And we just went around the horn in 30 minutes and uh, gathered information, doctors. Um, and so I feel like, I had more information than most. Mm -hmm. I, I, we had our finger on the pulse on what was going on in China, which was the first one to get hit, when they were opening back up, things that were going on there, things going on in Taiwan and Hong Kong and Japan, Italy. And um, it became very apparent on those calls very early on that the death rate was not nearly what the media was talking about. Yep. It, it, did, it did certainly hit the elderly and those with comorbidities harder than others, but it, but it was really clear to us and no one else, uh, at least it seemed that way in the media, that um, this was not as bad as, as everybody was making it out to be. And, um, and so in my mind, it was, you know what? Uh, and by the way, I also knew that a vaccine best case, best case was early next year. Yep, and, right. I, and I also knew that most people won't take, not most, a lot of people won't take a vaccine period, doesn't matter. They're certainly not going to take a vaccine where they rush through the process. And, right. even, with, and even, even with a vaccine, you're not going to get 100% effectiveness because that's just the deal. Right. Yeah. So, so I, it just became clear in my mind that the first government to allow an event we're doing, um, and we're going to do it to the best of our ability to be a gold standard event, we'll follow all the protocols so that we could provide hope for people because, in my opinion, the bigger issue – was, you know, one of, the, one of the bits of data, I don't know if you guys saw it, that I got on the Warrior call, 
was that um, people were worried about um, domestic violence, about people having yeah. suicidal yeah. thoughts trapped at home. So there are negative consequences to locking people up. And, and in the UK, they had opened up a suicide hotline during, during these 80 days, and 500,000 people called in. Yeah. It's not a big country either. Right? No. And so, and so I said, like, forget about us wanting to do it as a company. Right. We need to do it. People like Ex the outlet. Exactly. To do this. So, um, so anyway, it created a shitstorm. I, I went out uh, on, in the media and I said, we're doing this. And about 30% of people just lost their mind. It's too soon. That's irresponsible. You're a killer, blah, 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 all this stuff. And so, um, okay. My answer to that, by the way, is when would you like us to host an event? Is it when the government says it is okay? Is it when there's a cure? Like, right. when, you tell me, when, when is that? Right. No, well, I, the I, other thing is on the, on the spectrum of risk, outdoor races, that's low. That's low. Super low. It's low. Super low. It, well, it, I, I, and, and as you said, I, I, either, either early, I've been watching, I've been watching you so much recently. I don't know whether you said it earlier in the podcast or in something else I, I saw, but frankly, your typical racer is the least likely, I mean, they, they don't have any of the, you know, yeah, they're not, yeah. they don't have diabetes. They don't, they're not overweight. I mean, they're, they're the least likely to be struck down by this to begin with. I mean, the infection rate of a of Spartan race uh, uh, person was, was probably, you know, not even measurable. The virus runs away from our participants. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I agree with you, you know, to me, I was really happy to see it, uh, to, to, to your point. I mean, I just felt better. It's like, gosh, okay, Spartan race is starting up again, you know, getting back to that comparison. Disney World, hopefully they'll be opening up again. And, and you know, so we can get back to some level of normality while, you know, again, still exercising. By, some by the way, the virus problems. will never go away. Like, right. it's never going to go away. It's an invisible enemy. It's going to be around. The best thing you can do is stay healthy. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. 100% agree. Paul? Do we have a lightning hey. round today, Mr. Marriott? Oh, gosh. I, ah. I, got, I get so excited. All right. Uh, ask a question, and I will. We, we normally do a lightning round. I've obviously been ill prepared. So ask one more question, Paul, and I'll, I'll develop it. Um, sure. Um, one more wrestling question. OK. We talk wrestling. Um, no, uh, you are going down to Jacksonville. Uh, along the interstate. I'm trying to figure out how we could make that work. Uh, when do you guys come back? We're coming back on the 15th. I want to be back on the farm because we're going to hold an informal wrestling camp for two weeks here. So uh, your kids are welcome to come. Uh, when, when is it? I'm going to go from the 15th till July 1 on the farm. Um, we're going to do one hike a day to the top, carrying weight. We'll probably do 30 rope climbs a day. I'm going to get everybody to mountain bike, whether they know how or not. We got a lot of bikes here yeah. and then two solid wrestling practices. Andy, Andy teaches like the Russian method of, yeah. of wrestling practice. It's pretty awesome um, because we've been to lots of practices all around the world. And this is a very basic and very unique to anything I've seen. Um, it's the only thing that would stop me potentially would be um, I'd still need to work. Is there a Wi-Fi that I could hop on? Yeah, yeah, plenty of Wi-Fi. And you could, the other thing is you could just stuff the kids in my van on my way back from Florida. We just put them in the back as luggage and um, bring them here. Let me talk to my wife. That'd be super fun. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so, so lightning round, Joe, uh, is I've got five words. I, I, I can feed you one word at a time. First thing that pops into your head, and this, this is sort of our psychological evaluation portion of our podcast. Okay. And, and so we're really trying to get, get into how you think. So um, these words were, were, were thoroughly evaluated over many hours uh, and, and selected uh, precisely for their, how, how they might. <laughs> so good. Paul, you need to start reminding me the day before. Anyway. Right. Yes, uh, that's my role. Yes. <laughs> okay, first word, pasta. Pasta? Yeah. I ate way too much of it as a kid. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood and uh, we lived on pasta too much. Oh, all right. Next one might be, uh, this is one, one I'm very interested in. Athens. Athens. I, I choose Sparta over Athens any day, any day of the week. I've uh, been to Athens, but only on my way to Sparta, Greece. 
and and you're standing by Spartan as the as the Sparta as the uh, uh, cradle of democracy. Sparta, Sparta as, as far as I'm concerned, created democracy. Okay, staying with that. Okay, mud. Mud. Mud is very very good for you. Uh, your your immune system needs practice. Um, if it doesn't have practice and it doesn't fight a good fight every single day, uh, it will be uh, ill prepared for when the next pathogen shows up. So get in the fucking mud. You know, it, it's, as a sidebar, it's funny. I mean, I've read things as well. I couldn't agree with you more that say part of the reason there's so many more allergies with kids today is they don't go out and play in the dirt like, like we did when we were kids. And, and, we, and so very early on, we we're exposed to stuff that today's sheltered kids don't get. So uh, I totally remember, agree with remember that. Remember the comedian, was it George Byrne? No, not George, but George Carlin. George Carlin. He's a great video you could Google. He said um, when he was a kid, they used to swim like in the Hudson, which was basically a sewer. And uh, he goes, me and my buddy swam there every day. Everybody else got polio. We didn't get, we didn't get anything. We were so immune to everything. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. All right, two more. Um, sunrise. Sunrise, everybody needs five, 10 minutes early in the morning. That's when you should wake up. When the sun comes up, you should be up. When the sun goes down, you should be in bed. There you go. What about it? I, and, and I've heard you say that a lot, and then we'll get to the last one. What about it, in winter here in Chicago? I'm pretty sure it's the same in Vermont. Sun goes down at 5 p.m. Am I supposed to go to bed at 5 p.m.? Bed early. Chris, come on. It's the Spartan way. <laughs> you, you're complaining about, like, come on. I miss dinner every night. Okay. Don't eat, uh, don't eat dinner anyway. <laughs> no, but no, the, 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 uh, you said four hours before bed when you had the podcast with the neuroscience guy. Your last meal is at lunch. There you go, Chris. Oh, I don't know true. why you're we're pushing that. We're, we're built for this. Oh, my gosh. I, all right. I can't win that one. All right. Final word. Oh. Olympics. Olympics 2028 LA. Uh, Spartan is an Olympic sport. Is there it for we real? go? Is it so? It is. I mean, it's not yet, but it will be. Oh, it'll be there. We're fine. Nah, see, I gave you that. See, that was a nice one to give. So you can put the pitch. Get the pitch. You won't, you heard it all. We want Spartan race in the Olympics in 2028. Do what you can to get it on. Get it there. You guys got. So, you got to do research on all our emails and tell us what, how we could do it better. Yeah. Uh, what's the best? Is Susan the best person to reach out to for that? Is that the? Shoot me an email. Uh, Joe at Spartan.com. Cool. We'll do. Don't make, it, don't make it more than three sentences. I won't. <laughs> oh, that'll be tough for Paul. He kind of goes on. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Joe, you, you've been a great, great yeah, fantastic. guest. We, uh, your stories were outstanding. Um, you know, you, you know, you, you've been, I think your company's been a rock at Gibraltar. I know for your customers through this, but even for people, you know, uh, you know, from the outside looking in, um, you know, how you guys have, have come through this yeah. and, and frankly, you're going to be stronger than ever. And, we, and, and, you know, the fact, you know, you didn't even get into the fact that you've made this huge act, you mentioned it, but you made this massive acquisition of Tough Mudder right. you know, weeks before. I mean, In the middle I, I can't even believe it. And, and, and yet here you were being uh, inspirational to your employees, to your customers, mm -hmm. and frankly, even the people like Paul and I. So we were, again, we're thrilled that you came on our show today. We want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts and uh, uh, maybe hope to get you back on the show one day when you can talk yeah. about the races that are going on. Always, I'm always available. You guys, awesome. are, thank you. Thanks, man, be well. All right. All right. All right, we're back. And, and notice we've been joined by fan favorite producer, David Inman. I mean, honestly, the fan mail we get on this young man. Is just wow. off the chain. Right. Off the right. chain. So, uh, do we want to talk about what we're drinking or, or, um, you know, it is sort of a, it, all right, let, it is sort of a, a tradition in the show. I'm drinking. Uh, I hope, please, thank you. As always, Santo Domingo. Um, and I have to make my obligatory uh, comment that uh, those of you who've been paying attention or following the show from the start will, will remember that Paul was due to go to the Dominican Republic. That's true. Uh, on a wonderful paid for all expense paid vacation with his wife and that didn't happen and um I, you know so each week i remind him with my dominican coffee i'm, I'm trying to be in solidarity with him i, I don't think he's taking it that yeah. way but uh solidarity so well i appreciate you bringing that up every week chris i want it I, 
it's something we don't want to put on the show. Right. Uh, I've got, it's just all these uh, uh, coffee, uh, but it's espresso pulled off my uh, rock espresso maker, the one I showed you a couple episodes ago. Yeah. Uh, really like it. So, yeah. What do you got there, Mr. Mr. Inman? Uh, Inman, it looks like you're doing a cleanse. You're doing a bodily cleanse or something with that? No, I, I, this is a David's secret recipe. It's it's two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Uh -huh. um, it, it, in a way, it's sort of a cleanse. I uh, well, I think the news of the week that we need to talk about here. Well, no, is... before we go there, with, with, before we go there, before we go there, David reminded me, producer David reminded me, that, that there's been a mystery uh, on this show since the first episode where I showed my coffee mug, showed there was some writing on it, and said, at some point, I'll tell you you know, what it says and what the backstory is. Right. And, um, the people want to know. The people want to know. So, so today we're going to do it. Today okay. we're going to do it. So I'm going to get the mug in a place where you can read it. <laughs> <laughs> the stories, stories better. So here's the backstory. And uh -huh. that was given to me, that was given to me by my son, Danny, um, who's a great kid. And, um, you know, I got a Blu-ray player very early. Just in the real quick, game. Chris. Yeah. Uh, Danny has a dark side to him, by the way. <laughs> well, he wants to remind me. Uh, well, when you hear the story, yes, he wants to remind me every day of, of what I did, my actions. Um, so I was got one of the first Blu-ray players. And so we're talking 20 years ago. I had a Blu-ray yeah. player. And they just come out. And who knew that you needed to connect them to your wireless networks because they were constantly updating their software. And um, so that, you know, you, you, if you didn't get that update, you might try to watch a Blu-ray DVD and it wouldn't, well, I didn't know, mine wasn't connected. And we had Ray. Yeah. And um, it, didn't, it didn't work. It was, the picture wasn't working. Oh. And I was growing more and more and more frustrated. As my kids will tell you, um, I don't suffer these types of things uh, uh, gladly. I, I, re I, my reaction tends to get darker and darker. Yep. So I finally got to the point where I said, all right, guys, there's always a back door. There's always a back door how you can, how you can get these things to work. Now, in my case, the back door consisted of banging <laughs> on the back of the Blu-ray player. <laughs> And uh, oh banging repeatedly on the back of the Blu-ray player. Uh, and, I mean, the Is that way the calling it? it started working. So I said to the kids, aha, there is a backdoor method, and there it is, and it works. And that stuck with my kids uh, uh, to this day. And uh, it was, I think it was a year ago, uh, Danny sent me this mug for Father's Day. Yeah, and so every day I think I, I really like this Danny character. <laughs> and every day, I have to relive the shame of that moment of banging on the back of a Blu-ray player to see. Again, I don't know how it managed to make it work, but we did end up watching a movie. But um, So there's the story behind the mug, folks. Uh, Mr. That is a great story, Chris. <laughs> and uh, far... Far better than I could have ever imagined. Uh, uh, man, outshines nearly every story you've ever told. Um, there are a lot of things that happened this week, but first I want to make sure we cover uh, Carol Baskin, Chris, of Tiger King fame. Do you know about this? No. Oh, then that show? No. Oh, you haven't seen it. Okay, so... Tiger King, who ran for president, uh, Joe Exotic is his name, ran for president in 2016. Uh, clearly was not elected. Uh, after that, he then, and I don't want to give anything away because I'm sure Tiger King is on your watch list, but he then went on to um, uh, run for governor of the great state of Oklahoma. Uh, and he did fairly well, actually, all things considered. Um, but you know, a uh, very charismatic person, but not the greatest businessman, if you will. And um, eventually was sued, and his arch nemesis was Carol Baskin from the Big Cat's Wild 
something something out of Florida, okay? And she's got a shady past too, as described in the show. Anyway, uh, the two of, he's in jail as, as they do, but uh, Carol Baskin uh, took, took ownership this week of Big Cat's, Joe Exotic's Big Cat Farm. And, and I know, not just for me, but many of our viewers, they took that pretty, pretty personally. I'm just curious what your take is on that, Chris. I mean, how, how frustrated are you on behalf of Joe Exotic? I'm going to defer. I'm going to give some of my time to answer over to fan favorite producer David, like they do in Senate committees. I'm giving my time to fan favorite producer David Inman to respond. Uh, sure. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, I, I did watch Tiger King, so I, I, I am right there with you, Paul, and I, this did affect me personally in a, in a deep way. Carol Baskin... Uh, I think her heart is in the right place, but uh, oh yeah, you know, yeah. actions speak louder than words. And 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 uh, well, let me let me back up a little bit. I think that in general, after watching Tiger King, I learned that big cat people are a very specific, very odd type of person that that walks among yes. us. Yes, and, uh, true. And, you know, by the end of it, I was I was on my feet. I was cheering for the big cat community. Um, for as was I. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the show is a roller coaster, but but for Carol Baskin to take control of Joe's big cat farm or whatever you call it, not yeah. zoo, yeah. Edge of, edge of my seat. What's going to happen next? Right. Well, I, I just clearly have been wasting my time on documentaries and 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 other uh, no sort Chris of mind it, enriching. I'll. You know, in, in the midst of this pandemic, and there's, I'm sure, lots to talk about today because there's so much that's happening in our world, but um, in the midst of this pandemic, of all the things that has provided some comfort to a lot of people, it's a Netflix documentary, multi-part documentary on Joe Exotic. Welcome to 2020. Welcome to 2020. Well, so let's talk... <laughs> to uh, a topic more near and dear to my heart, which is our fabulous season two lineup. We've got some tremendous people lined up uh, to be our guests this season. Um, so we hope that you, that you follow, continue to follow us and continue to check in on what we're doing in any given week. We've got, uh, as you know, we, we had a CEO today. We're trying to line up some more CEOs, uh, some other email mavens, uh, other people who have good stories to tell yeah. about, yeah. you know, what they went through. Because again, that is, that's still, I think, Paul, you'd agree. Yeah. We want stories that, we don't just want stories, we want stories about you. And um, and and what got you through to the other side. Right, right. Uh, and side though Though you you did drop out there for a second, Chris. Uh, oh, I always drop out. No, man. it's it's a day of internet. It's a day of everything, right? Where it just feels like we're having to redo the world. Um, but the uh, the you're basically you're saying was want it. We want the right stories to tell, and so right. uh, this first episode, we really felt like we got the right. Oh, story. we got a great great story. Yep. But we want to hear. Thanks again, Joe. We wanna uh, we want to hear from y'all uh about your stories and maybe maybe uh maybe we can feature a bit on a, on, on an episode maybe we can feature you as a whole on yep. an episode or maybe you know someone that's got a story but we want to hear those uh email us at email geeks coffee at gmail.com um that is a great way to get a hold of us and yep. we will respond but uh yeah again uh whether or not it is uh maybe something you did innovative uh, within your work environment or something uh, your company did that you're yes. very proud of. Um, right. You know, we'd like to hear those stories as well. A colleague or a boss. Again, all of those are inbounds. We want to hear those. Um, and so, yeah, please, please, please do email us. Um, uh, one of our uh, colleagues at audience point uh, uh, worked pretty hard on putting together a uh, sort of a website for right. email coffee right uh which i think is season cool. two yeah, yeah. yeah. emailgeekscoffee.com um 
uh, again, it's cool. It's a, it's a, it's just a nice uh, jumping on point for what we're doing, a way to connect in all of those pieces. Uh, I don't think at this point we're quite committed to Twitter and Instagramming and TikToking and all of those things. Uh, but for now, I think, I, I think, you know, we're trying to sort of do the appropriate level of, um, of response. Um, does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Love it. Um, I think, uh, I don't necessarily want to belabor this, but I don't think we can probably do the show without mentioning it. Uh, the protests taking place across our country, man, we're certainly sensitive to them. Uh, we love uh, uh, our African-American and the black community, brothers and sisters in the midst of all of this. Man, know that we stand with you and we care for you. We hear you. We, we hear you. And so I think that's probably enough without uh, uh, scratching too many inches there. Yep. Um, but but I know I know that that has gripped our entire country, our whole world this week, and it's so interesting in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> right, it feels like just you know staggering from one crisis to another, and um, uh, we're all more exhausted than ever. Uh, we're all heart sick on on some levels. Uh, we all know. Uh, you know, enough tragedy around us to uh, last a lifetime. And um, well, you know, aliens, aliens was 2020. Uh, the U the White House confirmed the, and it was like quiet. It just, whoo, no one noticed it. Aliens, uh, did you see this, Chris? Uh, the White House confirmed the existence of aliens. Well, David's believed in them for a long time. <laughs> right, that was like April. Uh, the Cal Cal Caldona Cal. The the uh, Yellowstone vol super volcano. Yep. I'm sure you've watched many documentaries on that. There was like 24 uh, earthquakes in <laughs> in a 24 hour period. I was like, oh lord, welcome to 2020. Uh, that's enough. Yeah, we've seen that thing blow up in several movies. Yes, yes, and which near near perfect accuracy to the actual uh, us right, right. <laughs> Oh, uh, yes. Well, so uh, I think we've beaten this, this uh, no, episode. Here's the deal. Chris, I'm going to propose something, okay? All right. This is June, June something, right? June 8th, 8. 2020. I'm going to suggest, you, you've played golf. No, but yeah, I'm terrible. Yeah, but you've played golf. Yeah, I, I have, I've swung a club, yep. Okay, so you know what a mulligan is? Yep. Okay, mulligan for someone like David Inman, who I know has played golf but has never taken one, is uh, the idea that it's a do-over, right? You go, you pick up your ball, you're going to say, I'm calling a mulligan. It's a do-over, right? It's only on the tee. You can only do it off the tee. You can't pick up any bad shot. That's true. Off the tee. But again, 2020, off the tee, I'm calling a mulligan. And I, I... Say, I say, month of June, about halfway through the year, we start over. I'm off of that. Okay. I'm off of that. David Inman, tie-breaking vote. Yeah, count me in. Looks like we got it. Now, it wasn't a tie-breaking vote. We were both in agreement. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, you were adding drama where none existed. <laughs> Chris, I'm pretty sure when we first started talking, your exact words were, Paul, could you please bring drama when none exists? <laughs> your exact well, words. But you could see the terror in, in fan favorite producer David Inman's eyes when he heard the break the tie and, he, and his but his brain was saying there is no tie there is no tie it was a you said please bring drama when it doesn't exist all right well that was a great that was a great example of bringing drama where none exists yeah. so well done yeah, yeah well yeah. done well i think that's probably good uh, make sure you guys like and subscribe to the youtube channel we did get our vanity url at the end of last season which is pretty pretty sweet and awesome everybody who uh subscribed to our channel uh you all made it possible we, and and all kidding aside we really do appreciate that support that's why we're here in season two so thank you yep yep so anyway thanks for uh thanks for signing in and we'll see you we'll all see you next week and next time. look for announcement of who guests uh our guests will be on episode two later this week Until excellent then thanks y'all <laughs>